if you think about what conservatives have for almost any uh, problem, they say, well, the market. The market will deal with housing. The market will deal with racial discrimination. The market, cap and trade, will deal with the environment. For uh, people who are progressive, they tend to go to the state that the government will deal with racial discrimination or housing or the environment. But you know, there's a big distrust of the state, and not just by conservatives, but also by people of color who've been brutalized by a system of incarceration or a system of detention, which is shattering immigrant families. So we need a different kind of answer, and that answer really is about solidarity and mutuality. Hi, I'm Manuel Pastor, and I'm a professor of sociology at uh, the University of Southern California. The concept of solidarity economics is an attempt to sort of reframe narrative, theory, and policy kind of all at the same time. And, you know, when you think about the way economics generally operates, it operates from a notion of individuals as acting out of their own self-interest, almost purely. And if you're conservative, you think that the market will ensure that that blissfully uh, gives you a fantastic outcome. And so your answer to almost any problem, racial discrimination, housing shortages, even the environment, is we need more market. Um, if you're on the left, what people generally do is sort of think people act out of their self-interest and it needs to be tamed. Uh, and so your answer to almost any problem is the state. Racial discrimination, the state needs to intervene. Housing, we need more public housing. State needs to be there. State needs to deal with climate change. I think that's all pretty important, but what's interesting is that people don't just act out of self-interest. They also act out of solidarity, out of mutuality, and out of a wanting to be part of a bigger group and to belong and, and be mutual with other human beings. And we've created an economic system that encourages self-interest or tames self-interest rather than encouraging mutuality. We think that's important because a lot of our prior research has shown that regions, particularly in the United States, that are more equitable, that have less racial segregation and less fragmentation between communities, actually grow more sustainably over time. And so mutuality can actually lead to a more prosperous economy. When you think about businesses that do well, they're not generally the ones that are completely low road. It's businesses that uh, treat their workers better, treat their suppliers better, treat their customers better. That's a sustainable path for the long run. So we've been thinking a lot, my colleague Chris Benner at the University of uh, uh, California at Santa Cruz, a lot about how to sort of do a new kind of economics, solidarity economics, that would lift up the benefits of mutuality. So in an era in, of rising inequality, uh, we see tremendous tension. And that tremendous tension is actually also, particularly in the United States, driven by racial anxiety as well. And so what we've tried to do is to think a lot about how building bonds between people could lead to more prosperity, how building bonds between generations can lead to dealing more effectively with climate change, about how building bonds between communities could really eliminate the scourge of racism that is both embedded in our economy and then blinds us to the economic solutions that we need in this particular period of time. We've got an economy and uh, society where people are looking at, they're really sort of at each other's throats in terms of trying to protect themselves rather than try to f figure out how to protect the society as a whole. We know that what people really need to be able to move forward is a combination of three things. Uh, prosperity, sort of the promise that life will get better. Um, security, uh, a sense that you will be able to be protected against changes that might disrupt your job. Uh, and connection, an ability to bring people together. That was really the secret of the New Deal. The New Deal promised a Keynesian economics that would promote prosperity and growth. It promised a security, social security, unemployment insurance, et cetera, that mean that you couldn't fall too far uh, when the economy uh, was staggering. Uh, and it also tried to connect people. When you think about the Tennessee Valley Authority and how it took one of the most 
backward sections of the United States and connected it to the rest of the U.S. economy uh, and sort of brought people together, that's really what the New Deal was about, prosperity, security, and connection. Prosperity can no longer be driven simply by making more and more when we've got a climate crisis. Uh, security has to evolve in a way that can deal with an economy that's filled with innovation and job changing and all sorts of stuff happening at the same time that leads people to be insecure. But how do we create portable benefits? How do we create a federal job guarantee? How do we couch that in our notion of mutual obligations? And then the issue of connection, the New Deal was fundamentally racist. It really excluded black workers who were agricultural workers and domestic workers and Latino workers as well. And it was basically a deal that, you know, particularly with the GI Bill, what happened afterwards, and the way that it was implemented excluded African Americans as well. We can't do that any longer. But we do need these sort of three things of prosperity, uh, connection, and security to really deal with the crises that we're facing in the current economy. You know, if you think about uh, the United States right now, uh, it's a lot like California in the early 1990s. In the early 1990s, California was racked by anti-immigrant hysteria, which led to voters passing something called Proposition 187, which sought to strip all sorts of social services, including educational services, away from undocumented immigrants. But it wasn't just racial anxiety about demographic change occurring in California. In the early 1990s, uh, nearly half of the country's net job losses actually were incurred in California because the recession of the early 1990s was driven by a cutback in defense spending and that rippled through our aerospace and chip manufacturing industries and really shattered California. And people forget that Rush Limbaugh began his talk radio career in Sacramento in the late 1980s and in the early 1990s sort of hate radio was perfected in Southern California. So that perfect stew of racial anxiety, economic uncertainty, and profiteering from political polarization, it occurred in California. And two decades, 25 years later, California has turned around dramatically. And part of that turnaround has been an animation of an alternative vision and narrative of the state and an alternative set of politics deeply connected to social movements that began to center immigrants, that began to lift up issues of racial justice and environmental justice, and also began to lift up issues of economic justice. It's no surprise that this was one of the first two states to raise its minimum wage to $15 an hour, one of the first couple of states to pass a domestic workers' bill of rights, uh, one of the states to really try to deal with some of the economic inequality that's occurring in the United States. So we've got a state that was really where the United States is right now. The way we talk about it is that California is America just sooner. Uh, and what's interesting about it is that it's a state that's now become quite progressive. Even the business class in this state recognizes that it needs to deal with the environment and climate, and recognizes that it needs to deal with over-incarceration, recognizes the contribution of immigrants to the economy, recognizes that we need to deal with this level of economic inequality and inequity in order to have a more sustainable economy. And what it means is that California is really poised to be the experiment or the, the, the sort of laboratory for progressive policy. That doesn't look like it's going to happen in D.C. in any time in the near future. And it's not just the Trump administration, but the sort of, you know, political paralysis that's occurring in D.C. We don't have that political paralysis here. We have an opportunity with a state that's attracting nearly about 50 percent of the country's uh, venture capital into our high-tech industry to begin to experiment like with things like a data dividend, beginning to understand that the reason why tech thrives in the state of California is because of the massive public investments in knowledge and technology that allow people to make private products from public investments. And also, when you look at Google and Facebook uh, and all of those other social media platforms, what they do is profit from the data that we share. And so we've got a situation in which we've got a high-tech economy, 
generating all sorts of profits, really from public investment and from our data. How do we impose a tax and begin to create a dividend for people in the state? So I think the state is really poised to experiment with a different kind of economics. The problem is that we haven't got a real frame to go to. If you think about what conservatives have for almost any uh, problem, they say, well, the market. The market will deal with housing. The market will deal with racial discrimination. The market, cap and trade, will deal with the environment. For uh, people who are progressive, they tend to go to the state, that the government will deal with racial discrimination or housing or the environment. But you know, there's a big distrust of the state, and not just by conservatives, but also by people of color who've been brutalized by a system of incarceration or a system of detention, which is shattering immigrant families in the state of California. So we need a different kind of answer, and that answer really is about solidarity and mutuality. That every time we're confronted with a problem, we need to say, what is the way in which we can create mutual bonds between people and create an economy that honors work by raising the minimum wage, that honors uh, people's lives by creating flexible time and a, creating a caring economy that deals with the people who are caring for our elders and for our young folks, but that also creates flex time and family leave policies so that people can also create for their uh, deal with their families, that cares for the next generation by caring for the planet. And California is so poised to do this because the politics are in place. There's another piece of this which I think is really important to uh, make clear because I think that the solidarity uh, economics uh, effort that Chris Benner and I are doing is distinct in a couple of ways. It's distinct sort of ideologically because it's trying to say that the underpinning for a new economic theory needs to be about uh, the question of our solidarity and mutuality. But it's also distinct because of its origins. You know, we wanted to do just an economic program for the state during the gubernatorial elections in, in uh, 2018. So about six to nine months before, we launched a series of focus groups, and they weren't worth academics or economists or policymakers. They were with community leaders and movement actors that had fundamentally transformed the politics of California. So people who were organizing to get more money for education, people who were organizing for immigrant rights, people who were organizing to de-incarcerate and create successful re-entry programs, people who were organizing to create a more caring economy, take better care of our care workers, and take better care of our elders. So we did a process where we did four focus groups around the state with social movement actors. And you would think that the thing that they might be looking at uh, was you know, whatever issue they were focused in on. But those conversations reminded me of uh, something that my good friend Van Jones once said about the March on Washington, that when uh, Martin Luther King at the end of that march gave a speech, the speech was not called, I have an issue. The speech was called, I have a dream. And what people were calling for grassroots actors was a vision or a frame about the economy because they felt like every time they asked for justice for immigrants or justice for workers, uh, they wound up getting a response of, well, that's not going to work economically. And they didn't really have a sort of broader economic narrative that they could go back to and felt like their real Achilles heel in the struggle for progressive policy in the United States was not a shortage of figuring out how to tweak the tax code or how to spend more money in education, but to have a broad narrative that you could go back to and say, this is uh, the way that we think about the economy uh, in terms of mutuality and solidarity, and this is the broad frame that we'll be using to move economic policy forward. So we think what's distinct about this particular project is the fact that it's trying to uh, really shift economic thinking in a fundamental way. Number two, that it really comes from the grassroots, that we have, uh, we didn't come up with these ideas on our own, we came up with these in a series of focus groups and interactions and long-time relationships with movement actors. And part of this grant is to have convenings with these movement actors along the way to make sure that this economic narrative is actually useful 
to people and that they can use it. And the third thing that we think is really unique about this project is that we understand solidarity not just as a way to organize the economy, but as a way to actually acquire power. Because fundamentally, if you want to change policy, it's not about just having a better idea. There are lots of bad ideas that find implementation in policy in DC and other places as well. And there's lots of good ideas that never surface because they don't, uh, they're not really powered by social movements that can make change. We knew from the research that raising the minimum wage was a good idea, that it would reduce poverty, particularly for working poor, and that it really would not cause unemployment. We knew that from the research, but we didn't win it until there was a fight for 15 of working people struggling for justice with a frame or a narrative about why fighting for 15 made sense. So. Solidarity economics, it's about a new theory. Solidarity economics, it's about a new set of conversations with grassroots actors. Solidarity economics, it's about a kind of economic theory that understands the need to center power.